everybody. I'm Elizabeth Alfano. Welcome to another episode of Awesome Vegans. And I have an awesome vegan right here, veteran newscaster Mark Thompson. Thanks for being here. Hi, everybody. Listen this to that voice. This is a voice. big uh, Jane Unchained day. Yeah, it is. I, because <laughs> the lovely Jane Bellis Mitchell was on my podcast for uh, airing at a future date. And we just finished about an hour together. So this is kind of cool to have a continuation now. Uh, it's two for Tuesday, if you've not noticed. That's what we're doing here. <laughs> two for Tuesday. Uh, I, before we start, if you don't mind, yes, because you're so fabulous, would you mind if I listed off all of your accomplishments? Please, please. <laughs> yeah. So this just to I'll make be you leaving <laughs> the room for a few minutes because it takes a while. Just so that you can feel good. Okay. So Mark. And, and we were supposed to have a little bit more time before meeting today, so if I've got any of this wrong, you just tell me. Sure. So, Mark, you have been a newscaster, I want to say, starting on Channel but, 11. That's true. For at least... Yeah, let's not. We're going to get into a no. long time. Okay, we won't, <laughs> we won't name it specifically. Yeah. Fair enough. But you continue to be... A, so that was with Fox Channel 11 here, News in, in Los Angeles. But right. you continue to be a contributor for the Young Turks Network, which I love. Yep. And also you're a contributor right here on iHeartRadio, which is where we are recording today. Uh, KFI, right. 640 AM. I think tonight you're even filling in for Tim Conway. Yeah, I was, right? uh, uh, I'm on with Tim every Tuesday. I, I filled in for him last right. night. And... and, and a KFI is a great platform, yeah. and just as it relates to animal issues, I try to sneak in references that everybody knows I'm vegan, of course, because they give me such a hard time about it, or they ask questions about it, and actually Aaron Bender, who's on the show, he is now vegan. So oh. uh, it's uh, And it's the most listened to talk station in the country, so uh, I view it as an important platform to kind of get sneak in, as I say, uh, references to animal rights issues and also to uh, even a fun way, like um, like they'll be ordering, they'll have a big order uh, delivered there of food and I uh, will say, go ahead, enjoy your torture or whatever. The, I mean, you know, you'll re I try to do it playfully, but because I think it's important that you remind them, People. even in a playful way, not to be obnoxious. I mean, again, you don't want to be that guy, but I do want to try to sneak it in so people remember what they're eating, you know, what they're participating in. Yes, you're helping people to make the connection, right. of course. Uh, well, that's wonderful. Did Were you significant in having Aaron go vegan, or did he come to it on his own? I, I wish I could take credit. Oh. I think uh, uh, Bender was, um, was vegan prior. Oh. Uh, some years ago, or at least vegetarian, okay. and then and now he's trying it again. So we'll see. Okay, and I always find the switch super easy. Tell me when and why did you go vegan? Well, I, I mean, I'm one of those cases where I um, I was actually telling Jane about this. You know, I was um, I was always envious of people who could do it. Imagine yeah. that. I mean, I kept saying, "Oh, I, I want to do it. I, yeah. I know it's bad, but I, I just can't do it. I'm, I'm I, someday. I'm going to be a vegetarian," is what I said. And um, I was on television getting dogs adopted and cats adopted. Mm -hmm. I was very active in the uh, animal adoption community, mm -hmm. and then I was. And this is something else, Jane and I talked about. You have to be ready. You know, like I was already yes. talking about it. And a few friends of mine said, you know, you were really, we could tell you were ready to go. Mm. So uh, I'm trying to think. Oh, I was Sam Simon, who was a dear friend. Sam Simon, um, who was creator of The Simpsons, and he's just a brilliantly funny, magnificent guy. Uh, he is an animal activist, or was an animal activist, passed away, but he was a brilliant animal activist. I mean, yeah. he may have... Uh, single-handedly funded some of the biggest animal rights organizations in the world, like Sea Shepherd, Mercy for Animals. Yeah. PETA has a yeah. building named after yeah. Sam. So you get a sense for this. Yeah. Um, and uh, I should mention not just animals. He's the biggest single contributor to Save the Children mm. in the history of the organization. Mm. So Sam Simon was a brilliant philanthropist and, as I say, a creative mind, creator of The Simpsons. He became a friend, and I was waiting to do his radio show, uh, he had like an internet radio show, and they were talking about some of the things that uh, are involved with animals and their treatment in the animal agriculture world. Mm. And I started to ask some additional questions, and once it was all laid bare for me, bam, I just went vegan. I want nothing. I had somebody come over and take all the uh, meat out of the freezer and take every we took we got rid of anything that had was an animal product 
uh, immediately. Yeah. Like, I didn't want to go, well, as soon as I finish this stuff, yeah. I'll change. No, 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 no. I don't want any part yeah. of this ever again. And so when people ask me, are you still vegan? I go, are you kidding me? That's That will never change. I don't miss anything. I associate it all with some of the most horrifying things that man has wrought on other creatures. Yes. And on the planet, and on our health, and on our wallet. I could go on and on. Uh, so for you, it was like a one day to the next, a, an immediate switch. Yeah. And yeah. it's been I mean, how many I mean, years? to be really, I'm trying to think of, it was might have been a week, but I don't think it was like even a week. Relatively immediate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And a long time now, right? How long it's has it been? been? I don't know. If that, you know, long time. When I run into some of these people, you know, who are on this network or yeah. uh, wherever they've been um, for a long time, I mean, a real long time. Mine's been six and a half years. Oh, good. So, so that's good a time. while, but that's not nearly as long as others. And I so wish I'd done it sooner. Yes. I mean, right. anybody watching or anybody who knows anyone who's young and can make this change early in your life, it will be the best thing you ever did Quality for your body. Quality of life will be completely and, different. And for, yeah. So I, I really wish that I had done it 20 years ago. Yeah. yeah, I feel the same. And when I talk to vegans, usually they always say, oh, I wish I had done it earlier. Yeah. For me, just a, some of you have maybe heard me say this before, I never wanted to eat meat as a child. I knew I didn't want to chew it. Wow. I knew that something was wrong. It made me sick to my stomach, and I was severely punished for not eating meat. And I was forced to stay at the table sometimes five hours by myself alone because I wasn't allowed to leave the table until I finished my meat. So I started hiding the meat, and then, of course, I got caught. So then I got in trouble for lying about it. So my whole life, I grew up in Chicago, I thought I had to. I, I really felt sort of, and my poor parents, they didn't know. They were trying sure. to do their best. They don't know. I sort of felt bullied into it. You know, as I grew up and I went out into society, I thought I have no choice here. I just have to do it. My nephew is an athlete. He went to the University of Oregon and the coach there said, I don't want you eating meat or dairy. And I was like, you mean someone gave you permission to not eat meat or dairy? Oh, I'm vegan. I was vegan like that sentence. I was like, oh, my God. Someone's telling you I'm vegan. I'm vegan. I've got permission. I'm doing it, which is strange that I would need permission, but I've just been so tortured. Is it? Not tortured. My parents love me. I was just, No, they, you know. they, as you say, they didn't know better. No, and they didn't know none better. of us knew better uh, many years ago. Right. Uh, once you know, I think it's it's hard. And that's why this entire network, the Jane Unchained network, and also your work and, and all the different ways that uh, your work gets out there, and all of us who try to get the word out in any way that we can, that's why it makes a difference, because it sheds light. Once you do know, it's harder to turn a blind eye to it. Yes, I think there's a great quote from Oprah Winfrey. Once you know, you can't pretend you don't know. You know. So I think when we all kind of string together the facts, and as we were talking about before, make the connection for people, uh, it's hard to pretend you don't know once you know. So sort of taking that a step further, you are obviously a veteran journalist, and you started your career, if I've got this right, really in environmental journalism. Right. I did, uh, I did, I've always done weather. I've kind of had a, this weather thing. They had me do weather and environmental science reporting. Mm -hmm. uh, that was probably at the... Uh, the broadest uh, scope of my career as a journalist, I was able to really do some things that Lovely. were um, that were challenging. You know, the thing with so many environmental science stories is you have to explain the situation, the scientific uh, study, perhaps or discovery, oftentimes, and then you you have to then turn it into a story. So mm -hmm. uh, in the case of the environment, you have to set the stage, what's going on now, this is what's happening, and you have to do it in a minute and a half when it's on television. So it, it, it presents some challenges, but th those were some of the, the most fun challenges that I, I experienced. Well, I, I wanted to ask you, because we've had an environmental nightmare, and as we have more and more climate change, this becomes more and more frequent. So obviously we had Hurricane Florence, which is an environmental nightmare. And I find that there's lots of online writing about the environmental situation. There hasn't been any coverage of the animals. What's happening to the animals online or specifically on TV where there's been almost no coverage at all? And I wondered if you could give your perspective as a veteran journalist, specifically in the environmental world, why isn't mainstream media covering this? Uh, the answer on so many things is if it doesn't make sense, it's about money. And I think it is about money. I think big agribusiness 
drives so much of the commercial support of newscasts around the country. And as a result, you don't see a lot of things critical of agribusiness. Uh, They talk about the loss for the farmers, quote, farmers. They're huge industrial farmers, of course. Yes, they're businesses. Uh, Yeah, but they're businesses, exactly. Mm -hmm. And because they're businesses, because they're such robust, big agribusinesses, they really, in essence, buy the silence of the media and journalists. So you hear again of the loss of the that these farmers have suffered. And they, they'll say, they'll call it livestock. You know, they lost X uh, in livestock. But uh, you don't hear about it as, uh, you know, Jane said a great thing. I hate, I hate to quote Jane all the time, but she's so smart. And Let's the way quote she, Jane. The way she says certain things. And one, one of the things she said was, if I told you I'm leaving warehouses, sheds, industrial farms full of dogs to oh, you'd go drown, nuts. Yeah. you would never, it would never happen. They would chopper in people to rescue those dogs. But when you leave pigs and cattle behind, chickens, um, we don't hear about it at all, as you just noted. I'm, it's 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 shameful, it's reprehensible, it's obscene, and it's money. That's the reason you don't. But but it. but here's a story as well. Even if you don't want to cover it from the animal perspective, which there's something seriously wrong if you can't see that perspective. There's a business perspective. So we had Hurricane Matthew in 2016. The same thing basically on a smaller scale happened. We haven't changed any of our practices. What insurance company would sign up to insure? And I'll just tell you the, from the animal perspective, what that means is they're letting all those animals die. They're paying to restock them as if they were furniture widgets. And we're going to do this all over again in a floodplain. So that's a story, even if you don't want to take the animal perspective. You're what, right. That's a great story and, that, that, that there, are no, uh, there are no changes being made to the way this land is being used, to the way this land is being protected, to the way the, the coast is responding to the bigger and bigger hurricane events. I think that's a very fair point. And why would the insurance company say, sure, I will insure you again, even though you've done nothing to change? That's a dumb business right there. So there's a lot beyond the obvious humane. And, the and you know, I'm all about hugging a tree and crying for the animals. Believe me, that's what I'm all about. But if you don't want to take that perspective, there is a gazillion other good business reasons, good health reasons, good environmental reasons. Oh, and if you care about your children and you hope that they have a future, there's a good reason for that as well, that you don't want to have industrial farming like we have it. But there are many ways to cover this story. They don't cover it on any any plane. So let me... You're right. That's a, I, I'm, I'm listening going, wow, that's really true. I mean, I think, you're, I think you're right to make the point, and it's not a point that I've heard made appropriately. As you say, it, this story has other angles by other, which it can be told. Yeah. That's right. So, so then let me ask you a little bit more direct question. Do you think it really comes down as a directive, you shall not cover animal rights? And that goes from the general manager to the news director to the news reporter. Is it that direct? Um, I think it, I, I, no, I don't think it comes down directly. I think it's, I think it's handled, it depends. You know, I've worked in big newsrooms where there are different layers of people. So when I, I you know, in smaller communities, maybe North Carolina, uh, is still a big market, North Carolina, but mm-hmm. but there may not be the layers as you might find as Los Angeles and New York mm-hmm. or Chicago. Uh, it may be a news director who goes, no, I want to concentrate on the farmers. There are viewers. I there see. are people. People are uh, concerned with the farming community. They work in the farming communities. I want to hear about the workers, how they've been displaced. I, I want to hear about the farmers and how they... I think that's the way the message is. It's not don't cover the animals. It's, I, I want to hear about the farmers. And so if I were to be the reporter out there and I were to do did something like, and the loss of animal life here is uh, un- unspeakably great, um, they would go, you know, I understand that that is one of the, well, I don't think we need to talk about uh, animal loss of life when so many people have lost their lives and their livelihoods. My point is, that's the way they would rejigger the it. I yeah. see. I, I suspect that's the way it goes down. I see. Although I will say, and I understand that perhaps this is not the perspective in North Carolina, but around the rest of the country, people who have seen those numbers, because I've been asking people, granted, this is just my, you know, sidekick survey, 
I've been asking meat eaters, what do you think about the pictures that you're seeing? What do you think about the, the flood all the way to the top of the building and you know that there are animals in there and you know that they're just throwing them out and restocking them? They're all horrified, which is a nice way for me to enter into the conversation and sort of make the connection and say, well, then don't fund that activity. Vote with your wallet if that's how you feel. But I'm not trying to lecture them in that particular moment. I'm trying to get them to make the connection. And most people, when they see those photos, I don't know if you've had this experience, they're not for the farmers. They feel that it's an enormous waste. Yeah, I, I, I haven't had that situation where I've confronted people with mm. pictures or even had that conversation. I applaud you for having it. Um, I, uh, I, 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 You can't look at those pictures and feel good about things. You can't look at any of the things that are happening uh, in the wake of these of that huge yes. storm yes, and right. uh, Florence in this case, and be okay with it. But I think you point up a great thing, which is it's not changing. You're gonna right. so you're gonna take all of that death. You're going to uh, put it into big dumpsters and get rid of it. And now you're going to put in more of that industrial death until the next time, and because nothing has changed. And you're going to basically restock death. Well, good for you. Okay. <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's just, you know, it's upsetting. Restock um, Death seems like it should be the name of a band <laughs> or something. You know? Well, that's our next show. Yeah. Okay. I just want to do a couple quotes and then I'll move on. Sure. Uh, so this is, um, I'm quoting here from TampaBay.com. Every time I see the same things, flooded lagoons, Chicken houses filled to the roof with dead chickens, said Rick Dove, an official with the Environmental Group, Waterkeeper Alliance, and a resident of New Bern, North Carolina. We never learn from any of these storms. We have the same problems, dead animals and feces and urine running down the rivers. Well, that's the other thing. As you know, the effluence from these pig farms, from these livestock Farms from these animals, you know, they're they're real living creatures, and yes. uh, they urinate and defecate, and all of that is and have uh, families and huge. communicate and yes. have language. More to the point, they right. I shouldn't have concentrated on the urination and defecation. We all do it though, and if <laughs> yes, we were yeah. trapped in a yeah. cage this big, and then they would just have slats below that lets that effluence go. It goes into big pits, and when it was inundated with water, all that toxicity streamed out into the community. Goes right into the drinking water, folks. So there are many reasons to cover that story of mainstream media. Many, many reasons. Uh, I'm moving right along. So I have a question for you <laughs> since you have uh, been vegan for well, six Well, your energy is really great. Oh. <laughs> if I had your energy, I would be uh, on another level. Great. Uh, you and Jane both. Uh, what is it? We, we do. Jane's we have a lot got of all, energy. Jane also yes. has this amazing energy. Yes, she does. Uh, okay, so you're a vegan, but you know... There are many advancements technologically in our food system, and that's not just for plant-based food. That's for lots of foods. Sure. How do you feel about clean meat? Uh, it's a great thing. I mean, clean meat, the idea that you can laboratory grow these meats that people want to eat because they become accustomed to eating them. You know, they, they were raised on them. I love it. I love it. I, I don't know that I could eat it now because I associate I, yeah, me too. meat and the taste with such horror. Me too. Uh, I just don't want to ever taste it again. But I know that there are many who don't want to ever stop tasting it. For them, it would be a great answer, you know. So I, I, I applaud it. It could be a real way that the entire system changes. So Memphis Meat, I love you. Hurry it up. I am <laughs> ready to buy. I got my dollars. We're ready to make it happen. So I always say on this show, you know, you vote with your wallet, and that does not mean you're not going to the polls. Of course you're voting in the midterm elections. Of course you are. And of course you're voting in 2020. But every day you have the opportunity to vote three times a day and really make yourself heard. And that feels empowering that you can make a difference three times a day you vote with your wallet every time you eat. All Indeed. Right. It's, fu you know, it's funny. I, I will have different events at my home or I'll have people over and I don't serve any animals, of course. I don't serve any animal products. Uh, but I wonder, I think the clean meat would allow me to then have, you know, steaks or burgers yeah. or whatever people want uh, who are not in the vegan or even vegetarian community, and that would probably open up the rest of the world to them a little bit as well. So there are also benefits because we can bring into our movement, I think, 
those who might feel a little locked out because they just don't want to even consider eating anything right now that's not from an animal. You make a great point. I think for so many reasons, it's really logical to be vegan, but a lot of people don't want to relook at their family history or rethink of what they grew up on, and they're not ready to take that magnifying glass to their own actions. I understand we're all busy. You're probably working with two kids and three jobs, and I mean, it's a lot. We're all stressed out with our phone all the time, and you just don't want to maybe rethink your food choices. I understand this would allow all those people to just hop right on board. And animals and the environment would be a lot better off. Yeah, I think very well put. Yep. Uh, so because you've been in the media so long and you've been vegan, I'm wondering if you could comment on any kind of change that you've seen. So when you first started, you said you were teased and people were like, oh, what are you doing, that crazy mark? Do you see more people opening up to it? I mean, there's so much more options in the plant-based food world. Uh, it's funny. I... I I think the reaction is still uh, the same. It, you know, n first of all, when you first make the jump, then people are reacting to it much more vocally or much more noticeably than the ones that you are vegan for years or even yes. just a few years for whatever time period. People get used to it and then they don't comment on it anymore. I still get from guy friends that I'll go, they'll go to steakhouses or whatever, and I'll go, always go along with them. Um, but I just have salad or whatever it might be on a side or, you know, a Brussels sprouts or whatever it is. Um, and I don't need any butter, so you got to make sure that that's, you know. And oh, so yeah. your ordering is a little more complicated, even though you're, it, it's fairly simple because there's generally nothing for you in on the menu in a steakhouse type situation. Um, those are situations in which I can get, uh, you know, fun poked at me. In the professional environment, I think they view me as a resource. They say, oh, you know, nice. they always go, well, what about this? What, you know, what is your view on that? They're always presenting me with these ridiculous hypotheticals. Like, I remember one of them on the air was... If you're alone by yourself on an island, would you eat a goat? Yeah, no, yeah, I'm going to yeah, go right. well, yeah. If you, they said, for $10,000, <laughs> would you eat a steak? And I said, of course I would. <laughs> and I'd give all the money to an animal rights organization. <laughs> yeah. Are you kidding? We love you. No, I mean, we really, it's like, well, I'm not, a, I'm, not I'm, I'm vegan. I'm not a moron. I was just going to uh, say, you're right. not an idiot. Yeah. But I mean, I guess what they were saying is they were trying to test my principles, you know? Yes. Like if you offered me $1,000 to eat a steak, I wouldn't do it. Um, but I, you know, I do a lot of voiceover uh, work. I do uh, commercial voiceover and um, some shows. I'm the voice of American Idol and, and other kind of shows along the way just to say, like, I do get uh, opportunities that come across related to voiceover. And so I'll get uh, fast food uh, commercials occasionally if, if for Arby's or yes. for McDonald's. Yes. And if I take one of those jobs, I donate all that money to a, an animal rights organization. I won't take any money uh, for payment on a commercial if it's having to do with eating animals. So uh, some might say, uh, well, why do you take the commercial at all if you feel that you don't want to be part of that? And the answer is because that commercial is going to run. And I'd rather that I yes. get the money and then push it out Move into it. an animal rights organization than than not. But I don't take a dime on a fast food uh, or any any spot that has anything to do with eating animals. So as you all know, on this show, Awesome Vegans, what I do is I interview movers and shakers, and they might be politicians, comedians, musicians, athletes, radio hosts who are changing the world and making it a better place for people, the planet, and animals. And Mark Thompson is doing that. I didn't know you did that. Thank you very much. Oh, okay. Well, that's, that's yeah, I, I think it's the right thing to do. So Well, and it's wonderful. You can advance your career and feel like you're doing the right thing at the same time, right. which right. always feels good. Um, so we're on a tricky tight time schedule today, but I do have a bunch more questions. Before I get into my top eight, which I always do, oh, every wow. show. How did you decide uh, on eight instead of ten? Most people go top ten. I'm not that bright. I couldn't <laughs> get to ten, but I got no, to I eight. Think you're br I think you're brighter than the top ten people. I like that you've chosen eight. <laughs> All right. Uh, but before we get to those, I do want to plug your podcast because in that long list of things I said at the top of how fabulous you are and what you do, we did not mention The Edge with Mark Thompson. That's it. And yep. you can find it at edge-show.com. Fabulous podcast on politics and culture and funniness and oh, comedians thank you. and yeah. stuff. I mean, we, do, we cover a lot of different things. We don't 
do a lot of animal rights issues. Uh, you'll hear it, though, uh, crop up. We just did a, an episode with uh, Jane Velas mitchell and we just did an episode uh, not that long ago about uh, elephants with Kartik, mm. who runs a great uh, organization over in, um, in India, yes. um, and, um, a- and so on. In other words, it does come up along the way, but I don't want people who are watching this show and expecting, uh, might be, who might be expecting uh, another big, a full meal of uh, animal rights issues and, and issues confronting animals to be disappointed when they get to my show. I think we do cover a lot of good stuff, and you can do a needle drop on it. You can just check out a few episodes and find one that you like. But it's just a bunch of different conversations, and, uh, and yeah, it's called The Edge with Mark Thompson. So For the are. record, you would never be disappointed in listening to The Edge with Mark Thompson. Oh, thank you. But uh, he's just being humble here. I'll sort of give a shout-out to my own podcast. So, of course, right now I'm on Jane Unchained because she's so fabulous, too. But this podcast does go to WGN Radio, and I think you and I share the fact that we're always trying to get animal rights stories into the mainstream news. Um, I do some freelance work for KCRW here, and, you know, I've done— lots of radio stuff before and TV stuff before. So I'm always trying to work those storylines in. And I have to say thank you, WGN Radio, for uh, letting me do my Awesome Vegans podcast. Hi, Chicago land. (laughs) Yes, Chicago, we love you. Because that's pretty awesome right there. Okay, kick it. Here we go. (laughs) Top seven. Are you ready? It was was top eight, and I realized I already... No, but I'm going to... Okay, I'm moving it back to top eight. Super seven, they like alliterative things. Ooh, the super uh, seven. seven. All right, I like how you roll, mister. Okay, what are we all always going to find in your fridge? Uh, you always find some version of veganaise or just mayo, where I really love that slathered on anything. So you'll always find it in there. All right. What are your favorite snacks? It could be a healthy snack. It could be pure junk food. Hit it. I'm uh, real partial to, this is not a junk food per se, it just, but these sandwiches that I'll make with anything from tofu. I love tofu. But again, I love tofu slathered with with uh, <laughs> vegan mayo. We have an addict here. Yeah, truly. I really think I am addicted to that stuff. And uh, But I'll, I'll add onion to it. And so I'll do it with avocado, but I'll, do, I'll also do it with... Uh, but I really like when I'm wanting to, uh, you know, just inhale food, I will go for that. I'm not a big one for... Um, like, you won't find cake and that kind of thing in, at my house, uh, per se. Not this to say I don't love it if I, I can find it, uh, like vegan cake or cupcakes or whatever it might be. But um, I'm not a slave to that the way I used to be. I used to be, uh, oh, when I, that's you. one good thing that going vegan happened, uh, 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 changed in me, is it eliminated desserts across the board a lot of the way. Like, there's still tons of vegan desserts, but you have to know where to go. And right. Like, I'll eat at a a high-end restaurant here in L.A. called Craig's. And, you know, you'll see a lot of stars there and all that stuff. They have a whole section of vegan options, and they have desserts that are vegan. So there, I will go for it. But um, junk food, I, I'm i not – I guess potato chips are my biggest junk food, but I don't eat a ton of them. I, I just do – I just slather on that vegan onto whatever I We're can. We're back and, to vegan yeah, there you have it. <laughs> Uh, what is your one, and maybe you just explained it, what is your one go-to meal at home? You've been doing radio shows, and you've been having commercials, and you've been working all day. You're, you're doing be, the Emmys, and then you go so, home. It's one thing you can make super fast. You're going to be so disappointed. I love peas, and I will. And green this is, peas? This is green peas. This is before <laughs> I was vegan. I loved it also. And I'll just cut open a, a bag of frozen peas, and I'll. I'll cook them and eat them. I'll eat the whole bag. I love them. Oh, my word. Wow. With just uh, mayo or vegan eggs. Of co- on well, of course. Well, we know this about you now, Mark. <laughs> of course. Well, your mother must be so happy. You uh, like peas. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think she <laughs> focuses much on that. But, yeah, once we get the word, once she sees this, she'll be very happy. I think we all know the answer to this, but it's part of the top eight, so i got to ask it. Do you have any pets? And if so, do you think they're any different than farm animals? Oh, um... Uh, I have uh, three cats uh, that I had a long that I got a long time ago, and then one stray cat that has just entered my life in the last couple of years, and she's fabulous. She got her. She was an emaciated little oh, kitten when we found her. She kind of made her way um, by the house, and, it, and it's actually it's a really cool story. But I don't know. I don't think we have a lot of time, so for the next time, I'll tell it. He's but coming that, back. There. Are, so that's four cats. I want a couple of dogs. Mm. Uh, even just one dog, but 
frankly, the cat, the, all the cats, of course, are these rescue creatures, and they've had some degree of trauma in their life. And I just feel as though they're... Uh, I don't want to compromise their life any further by bringing a dog into the mix. Oh, maybe, yes. the, uh, And maybe those of you watching go, you know, you don't need to worry about that. You can do something the next thing. I, I, So it's just cats. So we have four cats. It's great. It's a cat house. It's wonderful. Yeah. I love it. Uh, okay. And they're the same, of course, as farm animals. I mean, in terms of their, their sentience, Thank of you. course they are. Right. They're, their ability to connect, their sense of community. They have their own language. They have things they're trying to tell you. Sure. Yes. It's, uh, it's, of course. Uh, it's exactly the same. Right. Yes. Strange world we live in that you could look at one animal and be like, I love you, goo, goo, goo. And you could look at another animal and be like, oh, yeah, to the slaughter, we're going to punch you and kick you and torture you and think nothing about it. All right. Uh, what do you wish you knew 10 years ago that you know now? I love this question. Uh, I don't know that, I mean, I wish I'd known, as I think I've said, a lot of the specifics on factory farming. I'll tell you something I didn't know 10 years ago. If this is right. Uh, I didn't know that dairy was associated yes. with the calf being taken away from the mother. Neither did I. Uh, it's, to me, one of the great secrets that's been kept, and the marketing associated with dairy, with the happy cows giving milk, and even when you talk to people who uh, about veganism, about, uh, and they go, well, how come dairy is so bad? Uh, they don't know about the fact that they always go, don't dairy cows just give the milk? Uh, no. Yeah, the people think like, oh, aren't they sort of wanting to give us the milk? Aren't they? Don't they have extra? And they're just like happy to hand it over. <laughs> and it's a, a profound sadness. Um, in fact, whenever I'm in a restaurant and I'm and I'll get that question, and usually you get it from servers. Mm. I'll get it a lot of from servers. Mm. This is a whole other thing we could talk about, mm. which I, I really don't like this whole thing where they go, would you like some protein on your salad? Where oh. they go, protein, protein, where somehow animals and uh, and fish, which are really an animal as well, of course, but uh, they are viewed as, they're being pitched as protein. It's protein. Mm. Uh, the truth is that... Um, that's a that's a way of concealing the what it really is. It, 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 is there protein in it? Yeah, but there's way more bad in that thing that you call protein for your health than you're representing. Um, my you response like, to that is that I do not want a heart attack on my plate. Right. Because that's right. That's there's the, that yeah. too. But I I uh, so anyway. Uh, but on the dairy. When they ask her what's wrong, I don't I don't get what's wrong with dairy, and I'll always I'll look at my girlfriend, and she will roll her eyes because she knows what's coming, and it is a description of where dairy, uh, how you get dairy. So I'm extremely sensitive to that, and I think it's one of the most profoundly cruel and depressing facts about uh, this whole world. And I wish I'd known it 10 years ago so that I could have gotten the word out, I feel, uh, and I would have made the change even sooner. So that's something I wish I'd known 10 years ago. Thank you for that. I think if you ask any kid who grew up on a farm, they'll tell you that the wails from the mother, when her calf is torn away from her, haunt them. So just do your own research, which is one of the things I wish I realized 10 years ago, that you always have to advocate for yourself. Government does not have your back. If you think USDA is thinking about you and your health, think again. So you always have to advocate for yourself. And when you do, you find out things like this. And who wants to be a part of dairy in that cruel way? When people know, when you know better, you do better. Okay, do you have a favorite phrase that you live by? I'll give you a little example. So one of the ones that I love is eyes to the sky, nose to the grindstone. Do you have anything that you repeat to yourself like, okay, I got to get this done. I can do it. Here we go. I don't have a phrase. I love, I, I, I love the idea of having a phrase, though. I'm trying to think of what it would be. I don't, I don't have a phrase. Um, uh, I guess my phrase would be, can I call you back? <laughs> <laughs> I, I I don't have a phrase. I'm sorry, but that one's worked for me, so I recommend well, it. Well, and then do you call people back? Yeah, I try oh, okay. to. Yeah. Okay, yeah. that's great. Um, 
Do you have a sense of purpose or, and they're sort of one in the same question, it's slightly a little bit different, um, or is there something that you'd like to be known for? Uh, that's a really great question. I, I, I guess I, through the years, feel a connection with the audience mm-hmm. uh, in nice. different ways for different things. And I think I'd like to be known for someone who connected with the audience. Mm-hmm. I think once you connect, then you can communicate different things and different, different messages, expose information that might not have been exposed prior. So I hope I'm someone who is connecting with the audience and uh, will be remembered as having connected and having brought the audience some some things of value along the way. That's wonderful. And I think you do connect with audiences. Uh, so my last you know, question. this is great. I love this. So you're just <laughs> no, I just adore you yes, the, whole, the whole show. Yes, it's great. I need a little adoration. <laughs> Who doesn't? Last question for you. Uh, so what are your predictions for the future? And that can be animals and veganism, or it can be anything else. It can be 20 years in the future. It can be tomorrow. It's pretty general. What do you think is, is our future ahead? Uh, I'm... I, I, I will tell you, and I was thinking about this just today, I'm not an optimist. I mm. love optimists because they m- do make me feel better. So I'm sorry that I'm not an optimist. I I see a lot of grim things in the world. I see a lot of dangerous things in the world. I see a reluctance and fact of stubbornness when it comes to change, when it comes to realizing truths. I see America right now going the opposite direction. I'm talking about on environmental issues. I'm not even talking about uh, many other things, civil rights. And like when I talk about environment, I talk about animal rights. I talk about just a, um, a sense of enlightenment about these things. I see the country going the wrong way. So, uh, but, but let's talk about the world. Uh, the world is realizing some things. So even as grim as things seem maybe in America, um, again, about these issues, the world is realizing things. Having said that, I see the strip mining of the ocean and yes. how we are destroying yes. the ocean life around the globe, legally and illegally. Mm-hmm. Um, yes. I'm not optimistic about the future. I'm, uh, I would say that's why there's urgency mm-hmm. about so many of the subjects that you talk about on this show, mm-hmm. some of the things that we've touched on today. Uh, that doesn't mean you uh, that I can't be joyous about life and about all the great opportunities that this life presents. But when you ask me what is going to happen 20 years from now or what my outlook is, it's a grim one. I think the realities of this uh, rapacious, unrelenting uh, greed that has fueled uh, all of the, the, these, these awful things about the planet – uh, everything from toxic dumping to, uh, again, our, this, um, uh, it seems, unstoppable consumption mm-hmm. that, uh, with, without regard for its effects. I see those problems being something that in 20 years uh, becomes starkly evident, and then it's too late. So I hate to leave everybody with that, but that <laughs> you asked, and that is You're a bummer, answer. Mark. No. Yeah. And now you see why I don't get invited anywhere. <laughs> You know, it's funny, on this show I had Moby on, and he said basically the same thing, that it was too late for climate change. He said people might start to change what they eat. That's a pretty obvious that you can't sustain that model anymore, but that it was too late. He really feels that it's too late. I don't even talk about climate change anymore because it's become something that's been politicized, but I'll tell you what I do talk about. I talk about pollution. Mm. So forget about climate change. Now let's just talk about those pollutants that are in the air. Why do you think cancer rates are what they are? We're in a toxic bath of carcinogens every day in the air, in the land, and in the water. And, and, and we are going to be affected by all of that. So I do talk about that. Uh, poisons, pollutants. I talk about that in terms of the environment. I don't talk as much about climate change. Well, so sadly, we are on the tightest of time frames today, but I'm not being flippant when I say that I do hope you come back. I think we could easily have a part two to this. I think there's a lot more to discuss. Uh, If you did not get the message earlier, you want to go to edge-show.com so that you can get 
The Edge with Mark Thompson. And of course, you're going to subscribe here to Awesome Vegans and find me on Facebook and Twitter and all that great stuff. Mark's very active on Twitter and Instagram. You can find him there too, Mark T. Live. Right. Thank you. On Twitter, Mark T. Live. And on Instagram, I'm Mark Thompson TV. Mark Thompson TV. I'm Elizabeth Alfano. Everybody, thank you for being with us. I super appreciate it. And don't forget to be vegan. Bye-bye. Bye.